Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week we have with us another incredible guest. We have with us Dr. Chantal Cox, who is an investment manager working for a leading venture firm called Octopus. And prior to that, she was at McKinsey, leading teams, leading projects. And of course, her career journey started off as a junior doctor in a super busy trauma center in London. How are you, Chantal? Absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me. So the traditional way we do the podcast is, of course, taking it all the way back, the young Chantel. Tell us, you know, kind of the journey, the motivations to go to med school, to become a doctor, and then we'll kind of bring it up to present day. Sure thing. Thing. When, when you say, you say all, all the way, way back, back to be <laughs> clear, I'm only 31. Um, it wasn't that long ago. Um, but I suppose it started when I was at school. So um, my family from Sierra Leone, and I guess one of the big things for second generation immigrant child as, as I'm sure many of your listeners will be aware of is like how can you make sure that you're sort of financially secure like picking roles and jobs and occupations that mean that I guess you won't struggle like your your those who come before you have um and so I guess we kind of made a joint decision that that medical school was quite a smart idea um to be honest I've got a fairly similar story to like most medics and they're like I was fairly competent at school um, like science, like people, you know, the standard spiel that goes into <laughs> uh, personal statements for UCAS. Um, and I guess I really liked the idea of doing something that was a real like seal, seal of approval, but also with a seal of approval, but also um, still had that sort of scientific rigor. So that was really fun. Mm. Um, so yeah, I did like chemistry, biology, maths, history at A level, and then went to Bristol University to study medicine. Um, Mm -hmm. back in 2010. Amazing. And walk us through your medical school experience. What things fit with your traits, with your personality, with your skills? What things did you think I felt a little bit boxed in there? Um, Walk us through your medical school. Yeah, so um, I guess Bristol was at the time quite unusual, at least the course was, in that they're Mm -hmm. very like whole person care centred. So we did a lot of like thinking around communication skills, um, general practice exposure very, very early on, like in the course. Um, we did a lot of thinking about alternative medicine and I guess how thinking differently about what patients want, which I always found like really, really fascinating. I think the thing mm. I, I struggled with, I guess, in the first couple of years was that you were limited to the classroom for a lot of it. Um, mm-hmm. And you spent like hours and hours and hours on end in like lecture theatres, which I loved in terms of learning, but it was kind of draining, like energy draining as a, as a way of learning. And I think even in my second year, I was actually like not super happy, to be honest, at university. Like I wasn't sure I was that it was right for me. I was struggling mm-hmm. with like the fact that all we did was kind of like rote learn and then go into exam, rote learn, go into exam. And I got to the end of my second year and kind of felt like something wasn't quite clicking for me. And so um, I actually decided to intercalate at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I intercalated in bioethics and the course at Bristol was really great because it was sort of 60% ethics, but 40% medical law. Um, mm-hmm. So we spent a lot of our time in the law school as well, like really getting into the meaty, like yeah. very, very well known, but meaty um, medical case studies from like the past. And that was so interesting. And mm-hmm. I suppose what was weird about that year was I did my least amount of time in the classroom. I think we had average four to six hours a week of in person. And so much of it was just thinking testing ideas we like challenged each other and luckily I lived with one of my best friends at uni Antonia and she was also on the course so we would like be looking at things like conscientious objection and yeah you know uh, I don't know prenatal diagnosis and whether it was right or wrong and then we'd go home for dinner and discuss it all over a glass of wine and really like I really loved that year like I really really got to like Mm. I guess immerse myself in a different way of thinking a different way of looking at the world beyond like Grey's Anatomy textbook and Mm. making sure that I was ready for the next like OSCE and so I think that was kind of the year where I realized that there was probably more to my personality and more to my energy levels than just just being a doctor Um, and at the end of that year I decided to apply for some internships in journalism because I was blogging a bit and like loving just loving thinking differently Uh, and I ended up interning at um, a GP magazine called Pulse Mm -hmm. um and so I spent like four to eight weeks there just writing stories and like learning about that and I was like oh this is so fun um (laughs) 
so fun. Um, but then I think I'd probably, I'd upped my energy levels and my happiness levels enough to say, okay, look, I've only got three years left of medical school. Let me just go back and finish. Cause it's just, yeah. it felt like a waste not to. Um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I think a lot of that for me also came from a huge feeling of conscience and possibly guilt around like, you know, with a family who've given up stuff for me to do this course, but also like yeah. the reputation and the respect that comes with being a doctor in society. Like how, what would this look like if I left? Like I, mm. I couldn't do that. So I very much went back and did much, much better in third, fourth and fifth year of clinical medicine as a result of just knowing much more about who I was and what I enjoyed yeah. and what gave me energy. So it, I actually have no regrets with how it planned out, but I definitely think if I, if you're second year me, like, are you going to be a doctor? I would have said, no, like, absolutely. I can't, this just, it doesn't seem fun. Like, mm -hmm. um, so that was an interesting journey definitely a lot of our listeners right some of them are more junior and they're interested in exploring internships the word internships is very alien still and people wonder mm -hmm. right so i want to go and explore this passion of mine or i want to learn this skill we're all used to sort of doing an application to a university to an educational institution yeah but it's it's an alien world when it comes to organizations and firms um, walk us through that yeah. process and how people can actually start to explore a different world. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point about it being alien. I think it's particularly alien for medical students because you don't, you you go, you enter this sort of very well trodden path that mm. is designed for you not to stray off it because you're effectively doing a course that is like taxpayer um, yeah. subsidized, right? Like, so I don't think they want you to be distracted. And I say they mm. like it's some Voldemort style person, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> um, and I think the way I looked, at least thought about internships or got exposed to them were having friends who weren't medics who had to do that. Mm. So when you got to the end of first year of uni, you had all these friends who were like, oh, I'm applying to this bank or I'm applying to this, um, I don't know, newspaper or whatever, because I need to get a job at the end of this course versus yeah. us, like as medics who you're getting a job. It might be in the back goodness knows where you know the country but you've got it you've got a job pretty much at the end of it so we just we didn't think about that really mm, um mm. and I think the way I, I think about internships is like through two lenses I think one is it's like thinking about what is it that I might want to do when I grow up or at least for the next like couple of years and like yeah. what can how can I go and test and learn and experience that but I think for a lot of people and this that we often don't talk about it's like what experiences can I do that will also give me some money, right? Like mm -hmm. not everyone can afford to go for a whole summer and not earn anything. Mm -hmm. Like some people have to help themselves get through university, right? And I think that's the bit that we often leave out of the internship conversation. The reason mm -hmm. that a lot of the like <laughs> most sexy and exciting internships go to the same types of people are because those people have money, like as in their parents are helping them either with somewhere free to stay over the summer or they're getting you know, some kind of pocket money. But if you don't have that, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful about what an internship looks like for you, right? Because you actually yeah. need a bit of a return for the very, what seems like trivial work you're doing, you still need to get paid. And I remember even when I went for that internship at the GP magazine, I remember asking them if they could pay me for it and they said no. And I was like, okay, well, I, if I'm gonna do this for free, like I'm gonna have to find a way to live in London um, and because I can't afford to get the train in every day because that'll cost yeah. me loads of money. Um, and I'm going to have to find a way to like keep the whole thing cheap. And luckily I had a friend whose mum lived in South West London and said I could sleep in a spare room for a month. Mm. And that was genuinely what I did in order to, to pay for that. Um, and then like I was working in a pub all summer as well. So like it was mm. a case of like when I wasn't doing that, I was just pulling shifts to ensure yeah. I had enough money to get me through the, the few weeks. And, and for others, they're luckier, right? And that's fine. But I think it's a really difficult trade off where you want to go and do what's fun and what you like but in reality like <laughs> most people need yeah. to learn um on the application piece though I think again I think where you often see a divide on knowledge it's just that certain groups know, know more people than others so they know exactly how application processes work they know who they should be emailing they know or they might go to certain universities where um there are clubs or like special workshops that are organized for them so they know how for how to get in and for yeah, other people yeah. you've just got to research like crazy and for me it was research like I would be googling like various organizations what their processes were what they ex what their expectations were then I was a bit lame but I would just cold reach out to people so like I was on LinkedIn mm -hmm. 
um I was on I'm trying to think who else I think I just spoke to anyone I knew who like left medicine yeah and I'd be like do you have 10 minutes for me and in those 10 minutes I have like a list of 10 questions and I'd be like how did you do it what were you thinking um like would you be able to help me who are the three people you can introduce me to like just anything I could because my, like my mom like I grew up um in a single parent household my mum was a midwife she didn't know anyone like and not that's not a bad thing like she just mm. did not know anyone outside of the NHS who could help me so I was like I'm gonna have to help myself but this is just never gonna happen yeah um and very quickly you build a network you become a name that's known because you've spoken to literally everyone and at the time no one was leaving medicine really so there was like such a there were like 15 20 people who'd gone into like consulting or banking so it was like yeah fairly easy to like hit all of them at some point in a year um and so yeah like I think network's a really big thing but a lot of people are scared to start building that because it feels very foreign it feels very like you feel like you're being rude cold mm, calling absolutely. people it's a bit like a sales job where you get nothing back um, but it's so worth it in terms of how much you can learn from others um yeah and it's paid off for me at like every level of my career to be honest Mm. have you got any tips for when you first cold message someone on LinkedIn because I think a lot of our guests have previously said yeah network 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 LinkedIn is absolutely awesome so what the next stage would be sending that message have you got tips on sending that first message yeah I mean I don't think I was necessarily good at it but I can speak from the perspective of someone who receives them a ton of the time Mm. I think one thing is to appreciate before you write that message that particularly when you're looking for certain profiles and I can only really speak for like medics who've done something else or medics who've who've left um I'm sure you guys know what this is like because of this podcast um but we receive hundreds of them like hundreds so there is nothing there's nothing new about seeing someone say like hey Chantal I'm a third year medical student at insert medic insert university here um I'm thinking about leaving medicine before I've even qualified it's often like yeah, that's what I'm seeing I'm like you haven't qualified yet so you're not you know you're just thinking about other career opportunities like it's not mm. in leaving medicine yet right but yeah um you what you've done looks great and I'd love to speak to you about it and I'm like okay that's probably not going to make me pick up the phone or book a zoom link with you right because that is a really vague conversation I could have the same conversation like 100 times over and to me it sounds like you're an exploratory phase in a world of Google and ChatGPT, right? So like, Mm. I don't think that that's probably a good use of my and all your time. So my response nine times out of 10 is like, great to hear what you're thinking about, like do your research. And if you've got any specific questions, I'd be more than happy to like connect. So I think do your homework, like properly look at people's profiles. Think about Mm. what makes you stand out, right? If it's specifically, hi, like I'm, I'm gonna make the name up. My name is Megan, I'm a medical student. Like, I'm enjoying medicine right now, but I know there are lots of things I can do in my career. I'm actually looking at these three things, consulting, banking, and I don't know, big pharma. I've seen mm. that you're a consultant and you're at McKinsey. Um, I've looked at their processes and I still, I'm still not sure about exactly what a consultant does. And I would love 10 minutes of your time to answer these questions. Guess what I'm gonna do? One, I'm probably gonna reply to your questions on by email because that's probably pretty easy. And then I'm gonna say, but if you have any other, like I've, I've got 15 minutes, 30 minutes more time for you because you've yeah. just been a bit more thoughtful like do the work for people don't make them do work for you they the minute they think it's a hard job they just won't answer the phone um and that's not to say that people are lazy it's just it's just a lot of people particularly now in post covid world who are thinking about leaving and mm-hmm. we just can't speak to all of them right it's it's tough Absolutely. and also it's not right for everyone to leave either so it's also doing the bit of that work around like why do you want to leave is it because you hate the NHS and you hate being a doctor or is it because you love something the idea of something else more and they're two very different things yeah no absolutely I have heard of other people as well who have entertained the idea of leaving and then sort of they've spoken to a consultant and thought you know what the grass isn't so green for me on that side um so they've decided to know um so yeah there's people who <laughs> the grass is greener and some for some people it isn't greener I agree with that yeah um so returning to the journey now walk us through now graduating from medical school walk us through your first few years as a doctor how you felt yeah tell us what it was like yeah so um I guess what happened so graduated in July 2016 just come from come back from an amazing medical elective went out to the Caribbean Mm. um with some my girlfriends and we worked across sort of A&E and primary care out there and then went traveling Mm. for a bit in Central America so came back feeling like really good really vitamin d filled 
kind of excited to finally earn some money after like six years <laughs> of like you know seriously like swatting up mm. terrified I remember being really scared about being an F1 on a ward with responsibility and even like putting mm. myself into one of those like free courses at Charing Cross so it's like prep to be an F1 day um yeah. I remember doing that because I was so nervous and then, yeah, so then I went to St. George's in London for the Academic, Academic Foundation program and started off in plastic surgery, which was like a bit weird, really, in itself, right? Because plastics is something you don't do much of at medical school. Yeah. Um, in reality, you're more of a like, you're more shadowing, like in theatre, plus like, you know, prepping patients, helping consent, blah, 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 checking a patient's post-op. And then it's a general surgical job. So it's you know weekend and evening on calls with like mm. various things going wrong and like you know diabetic feet and etc like that that was kind of the role um I remember actually secretly quite enjoying the camaraderie that came with the surgical rotation I think mm-hmm. that surgeons are really good at like feeling of like being in a club and they really want you to like what they're doing because like they all like love surgery and it's like you get that feeling so that was really fun I remember, I remember going to see a patient, I think on my first weekend on call, who had some kind of pancreatitis, but he was going off. Mm. And it was me and one other F1 over the weekend. The med reg was just stuck in AMU. And this patient, we just, I just couldn't work out what was wrong with him. He just looked sick. Like there was nothing I could do. Like you go through your classic A to E, like you're mm. looking under the sheets, you're doing everything. You're like, done your sepsis, six. And I was like, this patient's ill, like ill as hell. And I don't know if I'm supposed to like, I mean, in surgical reg is like, call the med reg, right? You're just like, that's all that ever happens. Mm. <laughs> you're, just, you're either like med reg, surgical reg, do I get a scan? It's like your next step. <laughs> and I actually just made the call to call the ITU reg. And I remember going, he wasn't answering the phone. So I went down to ITU. He said to me, are you okay? And I just burst into tears, like light, like on ITU. And I was just like, I don't know what's wrong. Like, I don't know what's happening. The patient's really sick. I couldn't even like properly summarize the history. I was just like losing it. Bear in mind, I'm 25 years old. Like that, people mm. forget how young F1s are. Yeah. And I was like, you're sick. And I just don't know. And med reg isn't available. The surgical reg said to call the med reg and they don't know what even to scan because like blah, blah, blah. Like I've done bloods, they're not back yet. But like, like it just, you know what it's like. And then um, the IT reg was like, look, I'm not busy. Let me come back with you. And he was so, I remember his face so well. And he came up to the surgical ward with me, took one look at the patient, it was like, I'm taking him. And I was like, what? He was like, Chantal, you were absolutely right. Like you did the right thing. You trusted your gut instinct. All you need to have to do as an F1 is recognize a sick patient and you got it in one. But like, I can take one look at this guy and be like, he's heading one way. So like, I'll take mm-hmm. him, even if he's only an ICU for a night, like you made the right call. And I've never been so relieved, but I also remember feeling like so alone like so mm. alone in that moment with my thoughts even though there was another F1 and you know because hospitals are really busy places you don't want to like alert all the other or stress all the other patients out you also always want to feel really competent and look competent but at the same time word goes around very quickly if you're not a great F1 do you know what I mean so yeah. there's like that whole feeling and so there's so much pressure on you at that age and it didn't feel like at the time I had many outlets for like sharing that pressure. I remember feeling that. Um, It got easier though throughout F1 and F2. Like you just get used to seeing sick patients, rinse repeating. And it got particularly much easier after doing an A&E like block, right? Because Mm -hmm. at that point, you're just so used to triaging patients. And like, as they walk through the door of majors, you're like, this person's going home in about 10 minutes. Let me just, let's just do this, right? But initially, there's so much fear um around getting things wrong because when you make mistakes in medicine like there's a life at the other side of it right it's very very mm. different to making mistakes in other jobs um so look loved loved f1 and f2 in the end in terms of like feeling competent mm. um and then just wasn't really sure what i wanted to do next like people start pressuring you from the end of f1 or like what are you going to specialize in <laughs> um and i think I think I sort of thought I wanted to do sexual health or at the time it was called community sexual and reproductive health or GP did my GP placement and didn't love it after thinking I was a surefire GP Mm. um and then when I looked into training for sexual health there were like six jobs ever like in 
the last six years and the next one was in Aberdeen and I was like I don't want to leave London so I, that was pretty <laughs> much it I was like well that's the two roles I want to do and I d- like I thought I wanted to do and that's not the case so then I decided to take an F3 year mm. which my mum did not understand she was like what do you mean F3 I was like I'm just gonna loaf in <laughs> for a year and like figure this out, out. I just, just don't, don't I don't, I don't know, know. <laughs> um, imagine my mum we're on like F5 things are not making <laughs> sense you know, yeah. she's like you're going to do a recording in a podcast why are you a youtube or something i was like no nah, there's a vision but yeah i don't <laughs> have that feeling like, like to this day like my we'll come back to it i don't think my mum knows what i do it's with a good heart it comes from a good place but she only ever recognizes the doctor bit and that, i get it but i think particularly when you're from certain groups i don't want to bucket people like the, the way that a doctor is glorified in a family like is huge mm. And I think that it's something that often goes really undiscussed is that for a lot of us, we carry the, the weight and the gravity of our ancestors with us when we make decisions. So to make yeah. a call to not commit to speciality training, to leave medicine, which is so revered, mm. is so gutsy. That like people tell you, it's like, oh, you're so brave to leave medicine. You, you don't even know the half of it until you're brave and your parents came to England to work. Like you don't even yeah. know the half of what that means to leave. And I remember toying with it several times in F1 and F2 and thinking, no, let me get my provisional license. No, let me finish F2. Then I got to F3 and I was like, I don't know. Like, I just, I just can't commit to a training post right now. Like, I can't even commit to taking MRCP or any of my exams because I don't know what I want to do. And then enjoying locuming because I had so much freedom. So I was able to like work and choose when I did shifts, et cetera. Um, I was earning good money actually and I felt able to travel when I wanted I wasn't missing any friends birthdays or pay- babies mm. being born like I really loved the fact that I was a really present friend and family member and partner to my now husband I felt like I was just around and that was a huge I felt like I got myself back and then I had a friend who'd been niggling away at me for a while he was like you're gonna love he's also an ex-medic who'd moved to consulting he was like you'd love consulting you should try it and I was like mm, mm. I don't really know what you guys do and he was like, look, you've always been unsure about medicine. You've always like, liked the sort of portfolio style career, but you don't want to be a GP. So why don't you just think about this? And I was like, I still don't know what you guys do. Like, what, what are you talking <laughs> about? And then he was like, why don't you go to one of those like taste days or weekends and see? So I went to one that McKinsey held. Um, it must have been in like 2017, 18. No, 18. Mm. And um, it was a two day like retreat thing where they put you in this like, bougie hotel with all these people who are non-consultants and they talk to you about building a presence, about being a leader, about um, how to problem solve, about how to think about your network, all the things that I really wanted someone to invest in me between the ages of 18 and 25, right, at uni. Yeah. All the things that no one has time to teach you about the world unless you have the right family or family friends who teach you the stuff. But I didn't. And I felt I came out in two days, like, more people cared about me and my progress than I could ever have imagined. And there was this whole big bad world out there that I could mm. explore. And I remember walking out being like, if this is what it feels to work outside of my current job, then I want to try it. I'm not saying I'm going to like defect forever, but I just want to go see what it's like. So I walked out of that and I applied for consulting, like literally straight off the back of that weekend. Mm. And I said, Someone told me that you had a 70% chance of getting zero offers at any of the big three, so McKinsey, Bain, and BCG. So I knew it was unlikely. Um, but I said, if I get an offer, it's like 12 months. I'll do it for 12 months and I'll go back to the NHS and I'll go and save the NHS because I'll have learned how to problem solve. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, I got rejections from straight off the bat, I got rejected from BCG. Then Bain rejected me post doing the, one of the like maths tests you have to do to get in. And then mm. McKinsey, I got an offer from, and, and I went to McKinsey. Like, that was basically how it went. I make it sound easier than it was, but that was, like, the highlight <laughs> <of me. laughs> Amazing, amazing. And now you have to break it down. So consulting, right? You have to. So the big question that you answered yourself, right? And this, I'm probably going to cut this into several snippets because everyone's always asking <laughs> all the consultants, what do you even do? I'm interested in the big yeah. three. I want to move into this field. And they're probably sending linkedin messages to every consultant tell me what you do as a as a as a physical day job if you can go through that fine so at a high level 
a consultant and when I say consultant specific specifically what I'm referring to here are like the big strategy consulting houses like a McKinsey mm. Bain BCG big yeah. three if you're talking at the big four you're talking about Deloitte KPMG EY PwC but at a high level you are helping organizations solve problems that they either for some reason are at a loss on how to solve or they just need like your heavyweight because you've seen it across a ton of different organizations um, help them think about how to solve right and the idea is we're doing that collaborative, collaboratively with them historically mm -hmm. this has been like a consultant comes in solves for you leaves and then or makes some recommendations leaves and then nothing happens today that's changing and the idea is that you solve with the client um to help them improve something say it's like they want to improve revenue of a specific business unit or they're thinking about launching a new product or they're thinking about how they can improve the customer experience for a specific mm. um, store. I don't know. Like, it can be literally any problem in the world. Yeah. And as a consultant, you go in in a team, um, in my experience, of anywhere between three and, like, ten consultants, all of varying levels with different experience, right? It might be that one of you's a data scientist or data engineer, so you're pulling much more on the data perspective. You could have mm -hmm. someone like me who came in, very much from a clinical background, but was operating much more as like a generalist consultant who's there from like high level analytical and conceptual problem solving perspective. And then mm -hmm. it might be that you have someone who's much more like product or user experience focused. So you bring this wealth of experience to say, okay, you've given us eight weeks to help solve a specific problem for you. And it's our full-time job to work that through. Mm -hmm. um, so at the very beginning of a consultancy or consulting career, um, you know, you're doing a small portion of what is involved in that problem solving. So, for example, um, you're the new consultant. You've just joined a, a, a strategy house, say McKinsey, um, and you're helping to create the Excel model that helps you figure out what happens if you, I don't know, um, launched a new store in Birmingham versus if you launched it in Newquay. Or what mm. happens if you spend more money on marketing and sales? Like, what's the like output that we project from you making certain business decisions? Or you yeah. might be the person who is there to own the client relationships. So you're going to spend the next eight weeks, every two weeks, going to run a workshop with the client to bring them up to speed on what we're doing, and to like, I guess, survey and get ideas from the wider business to make sure you're bringing them along mm. with the transformation that you're looking to do. Right? So yeah. It's very much an active problem-solving job where you work with a ton of other people from across your company but also across the organization that you're, you're working with to help them reach like a higher goal yeah yeah and um what was yeah you have to tell us now so what was great about it what felt like ah uh, this is this is real fun actually um compared to say being an f1 f2 f3 um i think a lot of the things that are great about it are the things that are great about being a doctor actually so like super super collaborative like honestly mm. there's if you think of an mdt team like that's basically what you are as like a consultant team yeah. like it's it's on the spot problem solving all focused on one task or one overarching goal um but using a wealth of like experiences a wealth of like a diversity of thought to just like really refine what we think the answer or the recommendations are like, that was really fascinating mm. i think um other good things about it is just the the sheer um the iq level like people are so smart in the yeah. same way that right medics are so smart the difference is that like you learn you get increasingly more specialized in medicine so you start to learn know more about your lane right it's a bit like the mm. classic joke like oh all pods can't treat high blood pressure or whatever like that's not <laughs> fair i'm sure they can <laughs> but the point i'm making is i think it's like, true though <laughs> <laughs> like you 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 just learn to be like to, to own your thing and know nothing about anything else and then you just learn to refer 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 right mm -hmm. but like in in consulting it was like we're better as com combined than we are in individual silos and like the more we can leverage each other's knowledge the, the better and more like juicy this answer and recommendation could be so that was really great and i think like the third thing that i loved and i think i've sort of alluded to this already was just the investment in people like mm. I felt like my professional development was always a priority. Like if I needed to learn something, it was in my manager's job description to make sure that happened. Even if they couldn't do it, they needed to help me find ways to, they can. Like when I had any courses to go on as part of the job, 
my time was blocked like it wasn't like I was expected to be working and on the course it was like no yeah. having training that's what you're doing right it was you know every few months uh, myself and my cohort going off site to learn something to grow and and the idea was that or the expectation was that not all of us were going to stay at McKinsey forever and that's absolutely mm. fine but you're being set up with a set of skills and um experiences which mean that should you leave you're set up for your next role right and I think yeah that was baked into the to the tapestry right it was just really really part of it and it wasn't seen as like you're a traitor for leaving in a way that at times not everyone but at times when I left I felt like people thought I was defecting people assume you're leaving for money um mm. people assume that so many things about you like when you decide that you want to leave um yeah. but actually if you look at like society on a whole like people our generation actually move jobs every like 1.8 years now and it used to be our parents generation moved every 12 plus years the world has mm. moved on I'm not saying it's right for medics to all leave the NHS at all it actually breaks my heart every time someone emails me yeah but it is right that we think about whether whether people are right for the role and it's very hard to see that age 18. <laughs> yeah. Very, very hard. Some of the best medics I know are the postgrads who've done something else before and they've come in because they've made a conscious choice and they know exactly what they were what doing. They were doing. Um, um, I was very I was young, young and probably, probably too emotionally, emotionally labor to be um, a very, very, very good clinician for the rest of my life. Um, but it doesn't mean that I haven't learned like an unbelievable set of skills, which has meant that I was able to translate into consulting massively. No, I agree with you in the sense that putting aside kind of certain pressures from ethnic minorities and certain demographics of population, the decisions that we make at 18, you're super naive. It's not mm. an informed decision. And then to stick with that decision, it's, it's wrong to say people's passions don't change, you know, things change, you know, your priorities change. You're making a decision, you're not married, you don't even have kids, you don't have any sort of responsibilities. And to think that you've embarked on this journey means you have to kind of go through it up until, you know, the day you retire. I think it's a big fallacy. And the, the thing I love about our generation is they're a bit more on it. Like if they don't like something, they go about and do something. It might not work mm. all the time, but they're open to ideas. The question I had was, it would only be fair to kind of talk about the flip side. So what yep, were yep. the things when you go to McKinsey that you were like, hey, do you know what? This isn't what I expected. Maybe this was best in medicine. What are the, the cons of it all? I wouldn't say it's a con, but I think it's definitely something that needs to be like widely shared is that the hours are no different. So mm -hmm. if you think you're going to move into another job, whether it pays more or not, it, you're going to work like a 70 to 80 hour week. Like it's yeah. very, very well known. You just have to follow any of the consulting like Insta channels. Like, like honestly, it's tough. Um, I think you're really well set up for it if you've worked as a doctor because you're used to it. Like I was used to nights, twilights, coming off nights, sleeping for X amount of hours, starting the next, like, honestly, I, we didn't get enough rest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to do when you've been a medic before. And I think in that sense, you find it much easier to adjust than a lot of the new analysts at uni. They're just all knackered all the time. And you're like, oh, I'm buzzing. Um, and the <laughs> reason I think it's easier to adjust is because most of those hours happen Monday to Thursday. So you know where you stand. Think of it as like an ongoing rotor. You just expect to work 60 hours, 70 hours between Monday to Friday, but you don't work at weekends. And mm. typically, unless something's really like on fire at work, you don't really work through the night, right? So it's tough, but it's it's repeatable. You can make your plans. I just never made plans for dinner Monday to Thursday because I knew that I couldn't guarantee I'd go. But I was always around at the weekend. And for me, I liked that like just knowing where I stood was great for me. Yeah. I also liked the like not having a rotor, etc. Like I found that quite stressful. Like making switches and stuff just always felt so hard and painful. Um, yeah. So the hours is one thing that's a con. I think the other is like it's very. I think desk face is unfair as a way to put it, but like compared to what you're used to as being a doctor, I used to walk like twenty thousand steps a shift or something. Right? It was, you were <laughs> up and about. Like it's very very of work very different to like doing a lot of your work desks going for meetings doing desk-based kind of analysis making a lot of slides and powerpoint presentations um and that's a very different way of working that many of us again are not used to you know you do a powerpoint presentation for the odd i don't know audit or whatever but you, it's not the same um whereas we were churning out like 
a hundred slides a, like a week each or something with various yeah. different analyses on it so that's the other thing a way of working and then I think the third is just and I feel bad for saying this is a lot of people I think assume that because they've been a medic um they just get to fast track to being like mid-management or whatever no that's just not how it works being a medic gives you so much credibility in like a clinical on a clinical project or healthcare related project and it's great you've got so many insights because you've been on the shop floor but being a consultant or going into any other new role requires some humility you've never done it before so you aren't going to go in like right at the top and that can take eating a bit of humble pie because some of the people my first ever manager at McKinsey was three four years younger than me and mm. you've got to have just and it was hard because this year I was like oh she thinks she knows everything she's like a baby <laughs> she's not ever had to treat a patient and you're like you know there's a bit <laughs> of like pride where you're like geez how am I being told by like a 22 year old like how to do something and very quickly I realized that she was really good at her job and whilst mm. I was finding that transition difficult I had a lot to learn and the quicker you can swallow your pride and be humble, the faster you scale through these companies. And the difference is, it's not like medicine where each year it's ST1, 2, 3, and you do these competencies. It's like, if you're good, you just get promoted. Like, it's not, there's no, yeah. you, know, you can race through companies or you can go at, you know, a slower pace. pace. And, and I like, I like that, that sort of meritocratic nature of it. Um, um, but it but requires, requires you to have, have some humility. humility. Um, um, which, which gets, gets much, much, much more, more difficult, difficult the, the more, more senior, senior you are in the NHS. The NHS. Like if like you leave as like an SD6, SD7, like you've put in like 11 years, years of work, work or whatever post graduating, that hurts, hurts. Hmm. So to come so in and be really junior. And I think I was really lucky because I left as an F3. So I didn't have that much under my belt. Like I felt like a clinician, I felt like I earned my stripes. But I but wasn't specialised in anything, and, and I wasn't like a like reg, and I wasn't and nearly a consultant. So I didn't so I feel like pained by being managed, 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 managed by someone, someone who was young, younger than me. It just took me a while, a while to like to get my head around it. I'm glad you mentioned the, the humble pie bit. I think medics get humbled real quick in a hospital environment when there's regs and consultants. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as you move them out from a hospital environment, they turn into this alpha character all of a sudden overnight. I don't know why it happens, but it's maybe it's like a, a coping mechanism, right? Because of the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really glad you mentioned that. We kind of talked about the McKinsey, kind of your, your pivot to McKinsey. But the interesting thing with you is you then pivoted again. You went into a whole different space, um, a sector, which is kind of venture. Tell us about the, the, the mindset, the, the logic behind that and kind of that experience. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, in whatever career you embark on, you always want to look at the people at the very top and ask yourself if that's what you want to be when you grow up. Um, I think I did it with medicine. Um, I looked at the consultants, and whilst I respected them greatly, I didn't want to be one. So that kind Mm. of solved for why I should pivot to something else. When I was at McKinsey, and as I got more senior, increasingly more senior, whilst I loved what I did, and um, I felt like I could get to the top there. I didn't necessarily want to. And mm. particularly around 2020, uh, tragic killing of George Floyd, COVID, uh, like many people, I just did a lot of work on myself and I was trying to work out what purpose meant to me, what kind of life I wanted to lead, what kind of partner I wanted to be, what kind of daughter I wanted to be, what kind of friend I wanted to be. Um, and I was doing a lot of work for myself and I was thinking I feel like learning I feel like I'm growing but I don't know if I feel like I'm having the impact that I was like always thought that I could have and that sounds a bit like hedonistic I feel like trying to pretend that I'm like Oprah or someone I, I don't mean that but I think when you're fortunate to have been given an education to have been given opportunities um to have done well, to have a voice. I think you should use it. And increasingly I was seeing like a lot of younger black females approaching me for advice and counsel and coaching. And I was like, gosh, like whatever I do here matters, right? Like mm. I have to be, I have to be bold, but also conscious of my choices because I'm role modeling without even trying to. And so 
for me, um, doing purposeful work really matters. I spent a long time, it must have been about a year, really figuring out what I could do if I decided to leave McKinsey. And effectively, in terms of aligning with my own purpose, I settled on either you want to be the entrepreneur, like you want to be the person who builds a solution that solves something that impacts millions of lives, or you want to be the money. And this sounds, that sounds like a very crass way of saying, it. I don't mean it in the way it comes out, but I think that effectively for the boldest, biggest companies to truly scale and have the impact they want to, they need capital. Yeah. And when I look at the people who raise capital, most of them don't look like me. When I look at the people who are raising capital for healthcare, most of them don't look like me. But when I look at the people who need healthcare, they do. There was a disconnect, right? Um, and I figured I could try the sort of entrepreneurial operational side, but I didn't know what I'd do. Like I couldn't, I didn't have any ideas. Like I wasn't particularly, I'm still not particularly creative. Um, but I did feel like I had enough skills combined with being a clinician and being the consultant sort of skill set, a problem solving toolkit, felt like it lended itself really, really well to it. By that I mean, particularly early stage venture, you need to be really good with people, right? And that's both make, building relationships with them, but that sort of hunch, the hunch feeling that comes from a patient walking through the front door of majors and knowing that they're well, that hunch mm. from knowing when someone's lying for you, right? Mm. That hunch from knowing that someone's going to get better or they won't. You just you build that muscle so quickly as a doctor. Uh, granted, yeah. if I'd stayed for 20 years, it would have been even better muscle. I, I, I'm not trying to pretend that in any way that I'm amazing at it, but you start learning that from day one of medical school, a way of mm. reading people that like other people don't. Like when you have to go and tell someone their loved one is passing away within 24 hours or certify a death or tell someone that like, it's likely that it could be cancer or support someone who's got mental health issues in general practice. You have to be able to code switch millions of times in a day. That's a skill that's so helpful in venture, right? I think that's part yeah. one. But I think on the consulting side, you get very, very comfortable with being uncomfortable in that you, every eight weeks or so, you're switching to a new project. You've got to get used to a new client, new subject area. It could be a different geography, different culture. It could be banking. It could be consumer. It could be healthcare. It could be social sector, private sector, public sector. And you've got to be able to adapt in all those situations. And then you've got to be effective within 48 hours because you've got a project to do that needs to be signed off by a client who is paying a lot of money, right? So I was like, when you combine those two sets of things, like I can do this, I can do, I can be an investor and I can be a really credible one. Um, am I the best person in the room at financial modeling? No, I, I, I put my hands up and say where my weaknesses are, right? Like, do I get energy from financial modeling? No. Do I get things wrong sometimes? Absolutely. But do I have an opinion? Yes. Can I like analyze markets? Yes. Can I be thoughtful around forming an argument? Yes. Can I win deals? Yes, because I'm human first. But I'm also like, I'm, I back myself as a problem solver. Like I'll get into bed with someone and think about how how they can think about something else. I love structure and solving. Um, so it seems like an unnatural pivot in many ways. Like how do you can bring dogs to a venture capitalist? But like the skill sets do sort of flow into one another. And but don't get me wrong. When I first started, slap, being a doctor slash even McKinsey, I'd never even heard of VC. I'll be honest, never even heard of it. I've never met someone in that space before. So I'd never heard of it. Like, yeah, mad. It's actually mad the more I think about it. Tell us a bit more about kind of how you secured this role at Octopus. Octopus, everyone knows whoever's building in the space, they're leading in kind of a few domains, but health tech particularly. Um, tell us a bit more about the role you do, how you secured that position. Um, and what was it different that you needed to learn to do well in venture compared to kind of consulting? Because it is two different playing fields. Yeah. So I guess like Octopus, our sort of strapline is that we're backing the people, ideas and industries that change the world. And I really, really, really align with that mission. I think actually most clinicians would as well. Um, I think that the job itself is really multifaceted i think in the same day you can be an investor like a pure play investor who's like originating like sourcing deals um 
forming hypotheses on them and then trying to like convince the rest of your team that you should invest. You can also be a recruiter because you're helping your portfolio companies like try and hire someone. You can also be a, I don't know, a podcast like participant or like a panelist on, or somewhere. Like you're doing about a lot of like brand, uh, personal brand and octopus brand work. Um, and then you can also be like a very pivotal person within the team, whether that's being like a coach, a mentor, someone who's supporting on like an internal initiative. So you have to be able to sort of balance lots of things and juggle lots of balls at the same time. Um, what's super interesting though about venture, which again, I think aligns very well with being sort of a clinic, clinician or a scientist by background, is that it's very thesis driven. So you almost want to form a hypothesis about the world and reasons why, like we're seeing X trend in, in this market, we're seeing tailwinds from COVID or chat GPT, and we really think that there's like clear white space to for someone to dominate X space, right? And then the question is, well, who? Who are the founders? Who's building in this space? And what are they building? What's different about it? Well, why this team? Why is this going to win? That's really exciting, right? But it is like work that requires an actual like using your brain. Like you really do have to think. Um, so sometimes you're spending hours just doing deep thinking about space. Um, and then speaking to tons of founders um, every day, which is so exciting, who are really passionate about the work they do. They really genuinely believe they're building the next unicorn. Um, and it's what, what are the things that you need to believe to be true, to be wanting to effectively convince the rest of the team that we should be writing a check, that we should be investing in this, right? Um, and that, that's just super exciting. It's a really, really, really fun job. Um, um, in terms of the skills you need that are different to consulting, I think, in many ways, it's much more autonomous. You run alone. Consulting is very team-like, as is medicine. I think in, in venture, whilst I'm part of a wider team, and we all see each other multiple times a week, and we test each other, spar with each other, and we test each other, and push each other's thinking, you have to be a self-starter. You have to build your own relationships. You have to be going out and seeing founders. You have to be going out to be on ear to the ground around different issues, themes, um, because, it's such a fast moving industry tech is just like everything is outdated within like six months right so you have to just be on top of it um and so if you're not someone who likes sort of self-start run autonomously i think it can be tough um equally i'm an only child so <laughs> i don't mind at all <laughs> no definitely uh, yeah, yeah. so the the other question i wanted to ask is we know that there aren't many females in the world of money and venture and more so exacerbated by an ethnic minority. Yeah, How yeah. has your experience been from that viewpoint? Um, it's hard, right? Because I'm, I don't know how to be anyone other than me. So I always find that hard, that question. Um, I think that in all honesty, the NHS is where like I was born and like, McKinsey's where I grew up and by that I mean by the time I got into being in venture I felt quite confident of my ability to both learn and like show up in the workplace but also and I think this comes with experience to some extent and I've still got a ton of experience I need to get but I do feel like empowered to speak up in a way that I've I probably never did before um, and that confidence has meant that I'm very aware that I'm one of a handful of black females in the investment space. I take that very seriously. I recognize that I have a responsibility to those that come after me um, to make sure that as I, as I rise to the ranks that I bring other people with me. Um, and I don't you know, need to shout from the rooftops about the work I do there, but I, I, I see it as part intrinsic to my role, that like I'm doing the work to ensure that VC is no longer you know, white, male, and scale like that is intrinsically part of what I do I think in reality to do that I need to be doing a good job first and foremost as an investor I think I need to be eventually in a decision making role which means being on an investment committee where you actually give sign off for the investments that we make um, and then I think more broadly it's it's speaking about these issues in the wider ecosystem right mm. um, 
it's doing something about it. It's not enough to to show up every day, sadly, some of us. Like, we've got to do more. And I hope that by the time I have kids who are deciding what they want to do, the, the venture ecosystem looks very different. The entrepreneurial ecosystem looks very different. But that's going to take a lot of work from people like myself, but also like allies along that, along that journey. And I think you're right. And I think what's nice to hear from you is you're also conscious that you are in a position where you can make a change. But at the same time, despite maybe not wanting to be, you are a role model for other people. And I know there's many young people looking at you. I think I read an article from Ivan Beckley, who's kind of the co-founder of Silvera, who's also a black male yeah, co-founder yeah. in health tech. And he's like, when he looks around, he looks, he feels like he's a unicorn founder. Yeah, and yeah. similar to what you said, he has to work just that bit harder to get to where he is. And the same yeah, for us, yeah. we never had the opportunities, race, class, upbringing presents to itself to us. And I do think people like yourself can spot talent that maybe other traditional investors may not have been able to see previously. Um, and that may lead to change. Yeah, yeah and I, think, I think, I guess I, I see guess that I... slightly differently in the so two things. I completely agree with Ivan um, on the unicorn bit. I think, just reacting to that bit, I kind of see being black and female as a bit of a USP. Because I can bet if you're a founder who goes out to raise money and you have a hundred conversations, you probably only met one, maybe two of me. So I know you won't forget me. So I'm I'm here for it. Like it, I'm not saying I don't want other people to come with me, but right now I do not see it as holding me back. Like mm. I just make sure that when you meet me, like when you meet me, you get all of me and you see how credible I am and that like I'm someone you you want to join your board, you're I'm someone you want to work with. Um so I expect my I have to I have high expectations for myself and doing well, but I also see that as like my superpower so mm. that's part one I think part two in terms of spotting talent like, I don't know um I don't know if I'm better at spotting talent I don't think I've got the skill set of say my colleagues and we've got people in talent strategy team and they're just amazing right they've got years of experience at the top health tech company they know exactly what talent looks like I don't think I know that but I think the difference is I have a different view on what risk means because to me like de-risking an investment because someone's a serial entrepreneur points to one type of person like a lot of people can't afford to be a serial entrepreneur like it just they just don't have the financial backing so that's probably how I look at things differently it's like if my my way of de-risking a decision comes down to things that are driven by socioeconomic factors which naturally then affects I think minorities more then there's a problem mm. and that's we need to solve for that and talk about how we're you know thinking about risk um I don't think risk and talent are necessarily intrinsically linked or oh, sorry but yeah I guess that's again poorly articulated but that was just like one thing that came to mind as you're speaking no definitely um conscious of time we don't want to take up too much of my time I think what would be nice is just some advice for people that are maybe not thinking about opportunities but they're a bit more committed a bit further along the lines it's just they're that one step away from committing, be it venture, be it entrepreneurship, be it um, consulting. What advice would you give to them from your insights, what you've experienced yourself? I think my one piece of advice would be that, no, assuming that most of your listeners are medics, is that like it is a really great foundation for doing pretty much any job that you want to. Mm. And it's really hard to see it like that because that's not the way you're trained to think. But the skill set, that you have been, that you've worked hard for, you've not been handed, but the skill set that you've built in terms of relationship building, just sheer academic rigor, um, managing uncertainty, working within, within a resource constrained environment, working when you're not fully rested, to be quite honest. Um, you are really, really gritty, really, mm. really resilient. And it means that you are really desired by other employers. I'm not saying you should leave, but you shouldn't think of yourself as only able to do one thing. Um, the question is how you go about thinking about that, mm. how you go about applying those skills differently. Um, network, 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 which I know people hear all the time, but go out there, see what other people have done, just read their LinkedIn page, you don't even speak to them, but it'll, you'll see that there's a ton of stuff you can do out there. And then like, Finally, just like back yourself. You're already doing like an incredible job. Like I honestly don't think I'll ever do a more humbling job than mm -hmm. being in position. 
um my mum will only ever call me doctor so like kudos to me um like you we're really grateful for the hard work that like our nhs staff do honestly and i think we'll only really realize that as a society should it ever go um but realize that you're operating in a a vast beast of a machine that has its problems but is also a very very humbling place to work so mm. yeah no thank you and i do agree with the grit and the hustle and to be fair we can see that in your own journey kind of going through it um but no thank you so much Chantel, for taking the time out to speak to us i think it was inspirational and it's kind of nice to hear someone that's been there and done it like the, the thought process how does that actually work what's the reality of it all um and i like the fact you didn't do it in a very polished way, as some people tend to do. You, you said it the raw, uncut way, which is so what we, yeah, we love to <laughs> <Dangerous>. hear. <that. laughs> but um, no, a massive thank you, Chantel, uh, no for worries. taking time out. And a, a thank you to all our listeners.